while I'm sure there are many different types of Canterbury Bells, when I went to go buy some, all I could find were two. The classic cup and saucer from Burpee and the more simple bell-shaped Canterbury Bells from Ferry Morris. Since these are pretty much all that are available, these are what I'll be using in this test to see how they grow in the garden. Let's see what they look like. Although the seed packets may feel almost empty, in fact, because the Canterbury Bell seeds are so small, there can be several thousand of them. So it's a good buy. Handling seeds this small is very difficult. If you want to do uh, germination tests where you plant a specific number in a specific way, it's almost impossible. What I've had to result to is just the pinch and sprinkle technique. Several years ago, I did a comparison study of which potting soil produced the best seedlings. What I found was that super soil does the best. Because Canterbury Bell seeds are so small, what I prefer to do is run it through a quarter inch screen before potting them up because the larger pieces uh, are so, so coarse that they can actually interfere with the germination and uh, development of their roots. To plant, I like to uh, use five ounce cups with drainage holes that I filled up to the top and then I soak them for 10 minutes in very hot water uh, which cools down to about 80 degrees which is ideal for germinating uh, Canterbury Bells. Uh, I let it soak for a while so I'm sure that everything is thoroughly saturated with water and then before I drain the water off I take a pinch of seed and slowly spread it right onto the still wet surface and then let it soak a little bit longer so that I am sure that the seeds are thoroughly saturated. Canterbury seeds are so small it's somewhat dangerous to try to cover them. Uh, even the lightest coverings can create problems. What I do instead to make sure they don't dry out is cover them with uh, light transparent plastic to keep the humidity up. Uh, I do not cover them. And that should be about it. I'll probably get five or six plants per pot. I'll thin those down to the one strongest. Even though these are very small pots, uh, they will be large enough to uh, allow the Canterbury Bells to grow uh, for a good three months. They grow very uh, slowly and they stay small for a long time. I always start my Canterbury Bells inside because they are so small they are very easily eaten by almost any insect you'll find on the outside. It also allows me to get them off to a faster start. This is the grow chamber inside my house. Uh, it is lit by six 40 watt fluorescent grow lights and heated underneath the pots by a mat set to 80 degrees. If you notice, eight of the pots are covered with a sheet of aluminum foil. This is to block out the light. I have read that some references say that uh, Canterbury Bells need light to germinate. This is an experiment to see if that's true. Okay, here we are two weeks later. Uh, the seedlings actually germinated in only eight days. I was running the temperature a little high around an average of 82 degrees. Uh, this is uh, two weeks later and as you can see the first set of leaves have opened. We have a uh, pretty good germination rate. The first thing I'd like to point out is that these two rows of four were the Canterbury Bells that were under the aluminum foil and in the shade. They germinated at about the same rate as the ones that had full light. So uh, this would seem to indicate that the idea that um, Canterbury Bells need light to germinate is not true. One of the drawbacks of the pinch and sprinkle technique of scattering seeds into your cups 
is that you end up with very irregular uh, germination patterns and you can get clusters of plants which will uh, can choke each other out. Uh, what you're going to need to do then is to do some thinning. Uh, I usually like to leave two or three widely spaced seedlings to grow until they start to crowd each other so that if one uh, fails the pot isn't empty. Uh, the temptation is to use a tweezers because these are very small as you can see and pull them out. That's fine if they're uh, a half an inch or apart or, or more. The problem is, is when you have two like this that are very close pulling this one out could damage the roots of its close neighbor. What I prefer to do is to use scissors and go in and just very carefully snip off the plant that I don't want and always remove it so you reduce the chance of um, uh, fungus growing and in that way you don't worry about have to worry about damaging the neighbor's roots. This close-up shows just how slowly Canterbury bells grow at the beginning. Believe it or not this seedling is two and a half months old. This is why I think it's best to start them indoors in pots to protect them from the insects that can easily kill small plants that grow this slowly. It's the first of May and uh, the Canterbury bells have finally gotten big enough to transplant into the garden and to be large enough to withstand the attacks of the cutworms and all of the other nasties that are going to be after them. All we have to do now is keep them well watered and wait uh, 11 months and as unlikely as it may seem this plant will be three feet tall and covered with some of the most beautiful blossoms you've ever seen. Because Canterbury bells are a cool weather plant, growing them in uh, my location, the high desert, or any place that's uh, very hot and very dry can be challenging. One thing you can do until the plants get uh, larger is to cover them with a piece of hardware cloth covered with a handkerchief or a piece of white material. This lets enough light through for them to grow, but provides a little bit of shade to help them through the hot first summer. They bloom in spring before the summer gets hot, so they'll be okay the second year. It's now the middle of November, and this is typical for how big a Canterbury Bell will grow in its first season of growth. This plant has survived five nights where the temperatures got down to the low 20s, and it's still very lush and green and this is a good indicator for just how hardy these plants can be. It's now the uh, end of February and typical for my high desert location the uh, Canterbury Bells are starting to come out of their winter dormancy and you can see the fresh light green growth here. You can also see the burn marks from three months of below freezing weathers almost every night but Canterbury Bells are remarkably hardy so they should do fine. Some will grow like this with many shoots that grow up and flower. Others will have a single large stalk. As much as I admire Canterbury Bells, I'll be the first to admit that the basic plant form leaves a lot to be desired. The biggest problem are the side shoots, which tend to grow out and then curve up. Because the stems are so succulent, they tend to fall over, and if they twist, the stem can be lost. This problem is exacerbated by the fact that the joint where the stem meets the, uh, the main crown of the plant is extremely brittle. If you water uh, overhead with sprinklers, the weight of the water on the leaves can be enough, even if the uh, plant is uh, fully hydrated, to break these off. I find that there's two things uh, that are very important to prevent that from happening. First of all, create a very wide deep watering basin and uh, water the plants very thoroughly uh, even when the weather's mild say 75, deg uh, 75 degrees during the day uh, these can use 12 to 14 gallons of water a week so keep them well watered the other solution to prevent these from breaking off is to use a cage to support them I find what works the best is uh, dark green thin wire border fencing that's about 18 inches tall. I cut it down the side about five feet long, bend it into a circle and then tie the ends together after I've wrapped it around the plant 
and then make sure that all of the branches are upright and well supported. This will go a long way towards uh, solving all of the stem breakage problems Canterbury Bells can have. As they grow, you'll notice the Canterbury Bells taking on one of two forms. Uh, the first is the large rosette. Usually there will be one or two large open areas that will spread out and dominate the plant. You'll still have a few shoots off the side, but these will be the dominant features. Many times what will happen with this is you'll end up with a single long thick stalk with most of the flowers on it. Here's the other type. Instead of uh, a single large crown, what you'll get are dozens of small shoots. This will produce a more bulk, uh, bushy sort of plant and it'll be covered with smaller stalks, but it'll still produce a lot of flowers. Either way, you're looking forward to a lot of good color. Here we are on the 29th of April on a uh, particularly breezy evening. And as you can see, Finally, after 15 months, the Canterbury Bells are starting to put out buds. Now, when they open, when they bloom, each one is about the size of a ping pong ball. And as you can see, there's one here, 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 and it goes on down the stem. So when these bloom, and often they will bloom all at once, this will, these will be a huge burst of color. As the buds grow, they do something interesting. They'll stay like this for a week or so, and then all of a sudden, in just one day or so, they'll lengthen out to an inch, inch and a half, and start to color up. And then they just burst with color within uh, uh, just two or three days. And as you can see, here's my first bud. Just a few days ago, it was this small, and it suddenly has grown that way. This isn't completely open yet. That'll take another day or so. But we're on the march, and this looks like it's going to be a good year. Less than 12 hours later, the flower was completely open. The first of many, many hundreds this single plant will produce. Each plant will produce between six and a dozen main spikes, such as this. And each of those will produce many dozens of side shoots that can extend over a foot to uh, either side. When staking the plants, I like to space the stakes out as far as possible so that the flowers aren't crowded and don't get crushed. I had planned on waiting until the Canterbury Bells were in full flower to start my video of uh, what they look like when they're at their best, but I live in the high desert of Southern California, and if you've heard of global warming, well, we are ground zero. Uh, it's the middle of May, and we're already having temperatures that we normally don't have until uh, the middle of June, middle of July, and some of them are starting to suffer. Canterbury Bells are cool weather crops that deal with a lot of shade very well and even though I have them planted against a uh, west facing wall so they get shade in the afternoon they are starting to wilt so I wanted to get something in case they completely collapse uh, fairly soon. Uh, this is a light um, magenta one. We have a more traditional darker blue one here. So far I haven't seen any of the cup and saucer types. These are all the regular bell types. But you can get an idea of what's coming because this is just a few flowers. There are hundreds and hundreds more that have yet to open. Let's look at some of the other colors. Here's some very nice pinks. When they open at first they actually look quite white. They color up more the older they get. This is very nice. This is very light sky blue. Here's another dark blue one. And you can see one of the problems with Canterbury Bells. And that is the blooms are so heavy that many times, even with staking, the smaller uh, uh, stems of flowers will slowly bend over and hang down like this. It can look attractive, but if the flowers get too heavy, it'll actually break off. Unfortunately, because this is the last uh, plant in the bed, I didn't have room to space out the stakes, so it's a little crowded, but it's putting on a pretty good display anyway. Dark colors like this, you can expect the blooms to last a week each. Lighter colors like the pinks and the white can easily last up to two weeks. And speaking of the pinks, here we go. We've also got some pale violets over there. Very attractive. Finally, we have this very attractive light magenta. It's interesting because while most Canterbury Bells have five lobes, these can have up to seven. 
Canterbury bells are wonderful plants because while they take a year and a half to bloom, when they do bloom, they are just so outrageously beautiful that they're irresistible. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it.